Welcome back to HPP, the Hoops Prospects podcast. Last week, we wrapped up the NCAA tournament and previewed the NBA playoffs with special guest Law Murray, who covers the LA Clippers for The Athletic. If you haven't checked out that episode already, be sure to do so on hppod.buzzsprout.com or wherever you listen to your podcast. Uh, my name is Richard Harris, and I'm joined by three Hoops Prospects analysts, TJ Brown, Drew Barton, and Hugh Baxter. Today, we're going to be focusing on the draft needs for the teams in the lottery, and later we will be joined by super senior Stanley Amoudier, who helped Arkansas reach the Elite Eight for the second straight season. Gentlemen, how are you doing today? Doing good, Rich. Doing good. Playoff basketball is in full swing. My Warriors went out and got a really convincing win. I mean, I guess Easter happened too. You know, there was that um, on, on top of all the basketball. There was that. There was Ramadan, that going on. But Ramadan Passover. Yeah. Uh, 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 World War Three. Complain. A lot of things <laughs> going on. But hey, we have the NBA, man. So for what it's worth. A little, yes. little bit of a bright spot for me. Yes, thank goodness for the distractions. Um, so uh, what what are your thoughts? I mean, uh, you know, what kind of things were, you know, that stood out for you about the action in the play-in games and uh, what first-round action we did see? I guess everybody's played one game so far. Yeah, I can start us off. I can't stop thinking about the Celtics-Nuts game. That was the oh, most entertaining yeah. for me. And I actually watched it after it happened. So I was about an hour behind or so. I was doing some writing. And then I didn't look at Twitter. I just watched from start to finish a little bit behind. And I heard my roommates at some point just going crazy. You know, I assume, okay, it's a good ending to this game. I don't know what happened. I don't know who won, but I'm going to figure it out eventually. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I just – the, the master class that Tatum for the Celtics, as well as Kyrie Irving put on, was, was absolutely uh, – it was all inspiring, to be honest. The skill level that was on display, the the level of mastery, the clutchness, the difficulty of shots, uh, I, that was probably one of the best game ones I've ever seen, to be honest. Yeah, it was definitely by far the best playoff game so far. Um, yeah, it was it was tremendous. You know, the one thing that I I, I had to re- I had to replay it a couple times because I'm like, how did Tatum not walk? I mean, first of all, the ball movement. I mean, you really mm-hmm. have to have really have to have trust in your teammates that they're going to do the right thing. I mean, with 10 seconds to go, by the time they started uh, moving it around, you know, um, when Brown made the pass to Smart, I mean, we're talking maybe seven, eight seconds to go. And and then Smart makes a pass on top of that. But, you know, what really amazed me was Tatum. I mean, just without even thinking, he pivots. He pivots in the right – if he goes the other way, I don't know if he makes that basket, but he just pivoted naturally on that spin and it was just beautiful and he didn't walk. And um, yeah, what a game. Yeah. And even the the play before that, the Celtics defensive possession, I was just so impressed with Horford came up and doubled Kyrie. They obviously did not want Kyrie taking that last shot whatsoever. And then sort of left him like they doubled initially. And then Horford sort of slid back once the ball was out of scoring range. And then came as Kyrie did that come across the paint dribble, to try and get to like a mid-range pull-up, Horford just met him right behind him and did not allow him to shoot that ball. Right. And then once Boston secured the rebound, I love they didn't call timeout. I love that they just played into the chaos yeah. Yeah. and just allowed that transition offense where it felt like I, I saw Jalen Brown with the ball on the wing attack baseline. And I glanced at this at the time and I think it was like six or seven seconds left. And that six or seven seconds felt like an eternity. It did because uh, he, he threw it back, and then Marcus Smart got the ball. And I think every Boston Celtics fan in the whole world was like, "Oh my goodness, Marcus Smart is going to take this shot. We're going to live and die game one on a Marcus Smart three. But such a good play by him, just shot fake, one dribble, great back cut by Tatum to understand the time and score. And yeah, just that was a beautiful game, a great game. That series is going to be incredible. I'm so excited to keep watching. Indeed, uh, yeah, and Smart has really, I mean, always been a good defensive player, great defensive player, but you know, his playmaking, uh, and even shot making, I mean, he's just uh, turned into um, an all around player. And you know, when you think about that series, you know, Brooklyn probably has the first, the best player, and they probably have the third best player, but Boston has number two. Uh, in Tatum, number four in Brown, and number five in Smart. You know, and I, and so you know, if you look at the, the the real key difference makers, I think Smart might be the difference in that series. And how about Al Horford? 
Yeah, he's he's uh there's something about Al Horford in his Celtics uniform, man. Because I yeah. thought he was kind of on his way out, out of the league. Exactly. And, he came back exactly. and I just but and, I was really excited, man. I, I I enjoyed it. I think I mean that was obviously the game of the playoffs so far, but I also just enjoyed a lot of the other matchups. I mean, I have a lot of friends, family that were telling me that the Bucks were gonna steamroll the Bulls and the Suns were gonna just destroy the Pelicans. And while I still think there's a chance that those teams sweep. I'm just glad to see the level of competition. You know, I had people telling me that Minnesota was going to be embarrassed. And I think people forget like the level of talent some of these teams have. I mean, the Bulls do have DeMar DeRozan, Zach Levine, Nikola Vucevic. Pelicans have Valanchunas, Ingram. I mean, they don't have Zion. They just got CJ McCollum. There's a lot of talent on these teams. And so I think, I think this is going to be a pretty good playoffs round. The parody's back in the NBA. I mean, the Hawks, unfortunately, now with Capella out, I just think they're outgunned, outmanned. I think the Heat are going to win that series. And I think the Warriors have just too many weapons for the Nuggets to keep up. But other than those two series, I wouldn't be surprised if all of these games go, you know, five or six. Right. I, I heard that uh, Michael Porter, uh, Michael Porter Jr. might, he thinks he's going to be able to play in the postseason. Uh, the only way that's happening, I think, is if Denver picks up their game. But uh, right now, you know, uh, but yeah, it doesn't look good for them. Um uh, can I touch on the plane just quickly? Sure. The uh, I, I feel bad for our recent guest and friend Law. Uh, he uh, <laughs> and the Clippers. I was surprised, very surprised to see them drop two games in a row straight sets. I really did think they were going to be at least an eight. I can understand the Memphis game, but then to lose at home to the Pels, um, that surprised me a lot. Especially with Paul George back with that, with the Pelicans are just a really well-rounded team. They, I mean, they won that game. They deserve to be the eighth seed. Um, and I just think that is a disastrous result for the Clippers, who I was looking through a little bit through, through all the team's salaries uh, this morning, getting ready for this. And they have the third most expensive salary of all teams in the league. So for a team that's putting that much effort, obviously a lot of that money is going to Kawhi and to Paul George. But just for them to then miss out on the playoffs after – hanging around and being in that spot all year I felt pretty bad for the clips. Yeah. I think next year, I think next year, if they're gonna have a year, it's gotta be next year. If they'll have Powell for a full season and then Kawhi and Paul George, I think if they can't make a run next year, I, I just don't know what you do at that point. Yeah, right. exactly. A lot of pressure on the Clippers next year, all that money Steve Ballmer's invested. So um yeah, the big the big thing that came away from that game for me was uh, the the second game, which I also was surprised. Um, was how do we get Glue Girl on the show? Um, how about the one who chained herself? How about I, I think that's even more impressive. How the hell did somebody get a padlock is, and a chain? What is doing NBA right arena? now? <laughs> Why are people yeah. acting out right now? Uh, like just at the start of the playoffs, people gluing to the floor, chaining themselves to a stand. It's, it's weird. Hopefully, this doesn't continue because I don't want that to distract from the actual basketball at hand. But yeah, that was really, really strange. A lot, I, of strange, I read some, a lot of strange things are going on in the world right now. <laughs> I read, I think it was on Twitter. So, but I think both of those were coordinated in a sense that they were sort of pushing the same agenda and they were aimed against the Minnesota's team owner. I believe he has some, his company's decision making has gone against some animal cruelty stuff. And I think people are protesting that. I believe that's what those two are for. So. Okay. You better be locked in on the next Minnesota game because we got glue, <laughs> then we got the chain. I don't know what could be coming next. Someone just might light themselves on fire at this point. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, Memphis, <laughs> Memphis needs to amp up, amp up security for game two because something's good bound to happen. Well, just, let the, just let Patrick Beverly check everybody at the door. <laughs> there you go. Problem solved. Um, so uh, speaking, uh, of, speaking of Minnesota, um, you, know, the, you know, they – to me, they're, they feel like they're a year ahead of schedule for me. Um, but, you know, when you can bring Malik Beasley off the bench and you got Russell Edwards. And um, so you think about that, you know, I, I guess I don't know what I guess it, it, the, their past, you know, this kind of, you know, made me subconsciously just overlook them. But they're not they're not the same old Timberwolves. Um and so I, I don't know. I, I kind of have a feeling Memphis is in trouble. Yeah, I, told, I, I think Rich, you and I agreed on this last pot. I think Memphis is a team that might underperform. I'm not saying that they lose this series because I still think they're the better overall team. But I would not be shocked if they got bounced 
by the I think they would play the Warriors next. I wouldn't be surprised if they got taken out. I'm not sure they are the better overall team. I think their depth, uh, I mean, I think it's close, but I mean, Carl Lee Towns is finally really starting to deliver on the promise. I think for a long time he was kind of an empty calorie guy. And this year I think he really took the next step into becoming a, a legitimate superstar. I mean, probably the third best center in the league behind Jokic and uh, Embiid. But I mean, it should be a good series and we'll, we'll see. I mean, there are two of the teams that talk the most trash. Uh, they've got a lot of young talent on both sides. I mean, I think both sides have multiple number one overall, number two overall, number three, number four overall picks on both sides. So it should be good. I still think Memphis gets out of this one, but I think it's going to be a lot more competitive than people thought. Okay. I, th- right, I think so- a lot of the oh, – I'll sorry. one more point on the Grizzlies. I think a lot of their success needs to be accredited to their coach, Coach Finch. I think he's done an incredible job of getting that team to the right place and playing the right way. And I've heard a couple of press conferences where the players seem to really love him and they really like playing for him and getting behind him. So I think, you know, he's a guy that Memphis took from Toronto. He was an assistant at Toronto and they, they took him from there halfway through the season last season. And, uh, you know, I think they understood that he's a good friends with Nick Nurse and that's why he was coaching at Toronto. And, you know, Nick Nurse, I believe, is a great coach. And I think Coach Finch for Memphis is... Uh, not Memphis, sorry, Minnesota. He's a really good coach, and that's driving a lot of their success. Yeah, when the when the award announcements came out for the finalists, you know, the three finalists, uh, a lot of people seemed to be upset that he wasn't on the one of the three. So, and yeah, I could. Un- there were a lot of good candidates for coach. A lot of the year. snubs on a lot of different categories, in yeah. my opinion. But right. coach of the year, definitely. All right, so so let's move on and uh, talk about the teams in the lottery. And uh, based on how the order looks right now, uh, the actual order won't be finalized till mid-May. Um, we'll start with the Rockets, uh, who are the likely will have the likely will have the number one overall pick. Um, Drew, what do you what do you see as the Rockets' biggest needs, and what what prospects would be a good fit at this spot, the number one overall pick? Yeah, I and mean, I think we're all aware that there's kind of three freshmen that are circulating in that top three, um, you know, top three pick range. You know, going into what the Rockets were as a team, obviously they did not play very well this year. Very young roster. Um, picked up some good wins down the stretch, though, as the young guys, as most rookies do, started to develop a little bit later into the season. They are a bottom three team in total rebounding and defensive rating. And I also noticed that they're the fourth overall team in three-point attempts, but only 20th in percentage. And so I think for them, the first overall pick should be Jabari, Jabari Smith out of Auburn. I think he has a lot of abilities and skills to remedy some of those flaws. I mean, he's 6'10", moves really well, can jump out on the perimeter if need be, can drop back and defend around the paint if he has to. And so I think that can help kind of give them a bit of a boost at their defensive rating. And he has a really solid shooting stroke. He was 42% from three on about five and a half attempts per game. So for a Rockets team that likes to get threes up, like I said, they're fourth in the league in attempts. He could totally fit that mold of a stretch big. I mean, he almost plays like a wing. And in today's NBA, that's kind of the, the name of the game is having players be able to fill a variety of roles defensively and offensively. Uh, I know there might be some people that think Banchero had that big tournament run, but I think for a team that already kind of has an isolation scorer in Jalen Green, I just don't think Banchero really fits the mold even though maybe you could argue he had a better college career. I think Jabari's upside, what he brings to the table is just really high. I think he can answer some of the issues the Rockets have. Um, I know they also have the 17th pick, and I know we're focusing on the lottery, but another guy I think that is all over draft boards I've seen, but I think could really fit the mold for them in that 17th pick is Malachi Branham out of Ohio State. I think as the Rockets accumulate this high-level talent, you know, Jalen Green, and now they're looking to bring in Jabari or another, you know, number one, number two, number three overall pick. I just think a guy like Branham has a game that is just a bit of a jack of all trades, can fill a role, already had to play behind an established star in EJ Liddell. I like him a lot as a player. I don't know where he's going to go. I've seen him as high as 10. I've seen him as low as 23. But I think if the Rockets get their hands on a guy like that, who could maybe be um, their jack of all trades guard, that'd be a really solid draft if they came out with Jabari Smith and Malachi Branham, in my opinion. Well, on our draft board, he's not even close to anywhere near. Um, it, it has been updated lately, but right now I have him um, uh, in the 30s. And, yeah, I've um, seen him you know, down there I mean, he, he, he caught me by surprise because I never thought he would come out. And, you know, really, mm-hmm. it wasn't until the, like the last 
couple of weeks of the season, you know, that he really turned it on. Um, yeah, I, 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 I like your first pick. I, I don't know about that. I, I'm going to have to watch, you know, Branham more before I finalize his spot. He's, you know, I, uh, yeah, but I, I know thought he was going to come back I, for another year. Yeah, I, I did too. We'll and he can, he can. Um, yeah. so, you know, he's not, he's not a lock. Uh, so he certainly doesn't think he's lottery or he'd be signing with an agent and, yeah. uh, and he hasn't. So, um, yeah, uh, Smith is a good fit, especially for a team that really does lack size. You know, I think you might think about Chet Holmgren here, but, um, yeah, uh, I think it's time for, uh, you know, I, I think we talked about this, some. Um, last week, but I, I'm not really uh, big on the process. And I think yeah. there's, gotta, there's gotta be a point where you say, okay, it's time to move forward. You know, you can do it for maybe a year or two, but after that, I, I just think, I mean, you look at the Sixers and all the mistakes they made and all, if you, you could make an, uh, you know, a good playoff team with the guys they got rid of during the process. Um, so um, yeah, I think it's time for Houston to move forward. Uh, Branham would be a guy, you know, you know, they already have Josh Christopher, who's another, a similar type of player, um, who's they're waiting for to develop. Um, and the other thing about Jabari Smith with Houston, you know, he's going to give you shooting. Um, so, and, and that team's not a great shooting team. Uh, yeah. so I think, uh, that, that would be a plus. If they do choose to go that Jabari Smith path, do you think they try to move on from Christian Wood? Because I feel like I was getting the vibe lately a little bit that Christian Wood is detracting from their youngsters' yeah. ability to develop. Um, I guess as they'd be similar positionally. What do you think? Yeah, I could I could see them moving on. I mean, Christian Wood is a great fantasy basketball guy to have as somebody who won a fantasy basketball league with him. You know, twenty and ten <laughs> always twenty and ten always looks nice. But I think yeah. I'm hearing the rumors every once in a while that he seems a little bit disgruntled. I know he was in and out of the lineup for a bit with you know injuries and, and COVID kind of throws everybody for a few games here or there. But I think yeah. it, it's hard because he's probably their best statistical player. But we'll see. I think if they go with Jabari, I mean they do have the um the young center to uh Sangoon, I think his name is, who, yeah. who really flashed. Uh, so if they want to go full throttle and just give the range over to a team of, you know, four young guys and, uh, you know, Kevin Porter, uh, Jalen Green, Jabari and Sangoon, I mean, they might just say we're going to ride with these guys and, and see what happens. But like Rich said, how far, like, how young do you go to the point where now you're not even competitive, you know, for the sake of development? At some point, you got to put a competitive team out there because losing can as much as high picks matter, losing also stunts guys growth, in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and well, that's I, one of that's one of the advantages of, of Jabari Smith over Holmgren. I, I think Jabari Smith's going to be ready to roll, and Holmgren's yeah. going to is going to need some some time uh, to develop. All right, so are we ready to move on to Orlando? Yeah, let me let me give my two cents worth on the Magic. I think the Magic are lucky enough to fall into that number two spot where they they got the percentage at right now. For I think obviously they're in a position of great luck. Um, we all seem to think there's two or three incredible talents coming out. So in my opinion, they should take Jabari Smith or Paolo, whoever isn't gone at one. Um, either of those two, because ultimately looking through their roster, they just need the best player available still. Um, there's a, they're going to get a generational talent. There's a chance they get a generational talent with one of those two players. And I think they could be a really good fit at Orlando. I, I looked through their depth charts and they already have, uh, a lot of young guards, no one obviously incredible yet, but a lot of young guard potential. Cole Anthony, Jalen Suggs, Markel Fultz, even RJ Hampton are all really young guys still who are developing in the league. And I think they probably wouldn't want to add another one to that mix. Um, Suggs last year was their top pick and he hasn't showed a great amount yet, but I think he's going to really build himself into the NBA well. So, I mean, you could also make the argument for Chet here at the second pick. Um, I just think he's not, he's just obviously a bit more raw than the other two. And I think Orlando, like you said, it's been enough years now of, you know, tanking and rebuilding where I think now's the time they need to start to push if they can get healthy. They nailed last season with uh, Franz Wagner. He, uh, they, they're just adding great players. And so hopefully we see, we see a bit of help from them next year. I think if they get healthy, if Jonathan Isaac and Mo Bamba are healthy throughout the year, 
then they could really build an absurd line with regards to height. Um, you know, if they take Paolo or Chet, they could have at least three seven-footers in that starting lineup, <laughs> which could cause some problems for some other teams around the league. Um, but yeah, I, I think they just got to go, obviously, with the second pick in the draft, whoever's still available out of those two, and just continue to build that size. They've even got Bowl Bowl stashed away deep on their bench. They acquired him kind of quietly this year. So that's another footer, seven footer they could throw out there and make a, a real demigod lineup. But yeah, I think for them, it's not too difficult of a selection. I think you just take whichever one of those two is still there at two. Yeah, I, I, I can't argue. I can't argue with that. I, I think. Uh... You know, Banchero would uh, give them – they don't really – I see beside Anthony, I mean, a- any of these guys, you know, Hampton, Suggs, Wagner, um, they're all, you know, all around good players, and they bring a lot to the table, but I don't think any of them are go-to score types. And mm-hmm. so, um, so yeah, I would think that uh, he, he would be uh, – you know, the, the way to go uh, if you're choosing between Chet and him, um, you know, somebody they can consistently uh, get scoring from, you know, a go-to guy. And uh, yeah, so I agree. Thank Anybody you. else? Anybody I'm else? Glad. I'm glad yeah, you, you agree. Say, Hugh, I know you mentioned all the size that they have, man. At what point do you think it's too big? I mean, Obviously, Banchero, you know, they go with Chet, which, you know, you said they'd go with Banchero. It's, it's too much of a line. I mean, what do you see them doing, though? Because at this point, I think out of all the teams we've, you know, we've talked about and out of all the teams in the league, they might have the most young assets in general. I mean, yeah. do you see them maybe just moving off of some of these guys? Because at, at some point, I think it's like you can't have an entire team, at least in my opinion, of 22-year-olds and compete. Yeah. Yeah, I think there obviously is a point where that becomes too much. I mean, I probably wouldn't be the biggest fan if they rolled out Bowl Bowl at the two, Isaac at the three, uh, <laughs> yeah. Chet, Chet at the four, and, and Mo at the five. <laughs> that might be – other teams might be able to exploit that a little bit with their speed. But, uh, yeah, obviously they do have a lot of a lot of young talent. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if some other teams who don't have much talent at all are uh, sure. calling Orlando a lot this offseason, trying to maybe snag a pick or one of those guys to move shuffle pieces around because they, they got a lot of pieces right now, a lot of guys who – started to play pretty well last year. So, yeah, I think that's a good point, Drew. I think it's going to depend on the health of uh, Isaac, too. Uh, you know, yeah. if you, you can get rid of Wendell Carter if Isaac's uh, healthy, for example. Yeah, agreed. Someone I didn't even mention yet. Yeah. All right. So, we'll move on to Detroit. And uh, they were one of the teams that I looked over. And uh, we have a team here, um, not very good uh, on either end of the, of the floor, but especially on offense. Uh, and, you know, if you look over their depth chart, that's not a surprise. Um, they just don't really have scores. And um, there's been a lot of talk on that team about uh, Jeremy Grant being traded. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen. I think that would be a mistake on their part, but they it's been talked about. I don't know why. I don't know why he can't stick it someplace because he's a great player. Uh, another player the Sixers got rid of um, during the process. Uh, But getting back to Detroit, uh, 29th in offensive efficiency, 29th in three-point shooting. So, and if you, and if you look over the roster, assuming they want to stick with um, Bagley and continue to give him a shot, um, which probably not a bad idea for the price, um, uh, you know, really what seems to be lacking on that team is athleticism, especially at the point guard position and at the wing position. I mean, even Cade Cunningham isn't an extraordinary athlete um, and uh, and shooting. You know, I mean, uh, nobody on that team has ever really, if you look at them, is no one's considered really a knockdown shooter except for maybe Isaiah Livers. But, I mean, he's way down the depth chart. And certainly, I don't think he's ever going to be a player that you're going to want starting. Um, Having said that, um, I think, you know, really, if you look at uh, the top five players, uh, the best shooter among them would be Matherin. Um, But do you take Matherin over Jaden Ivey at this point? Uh, Yeah. I mean, they certainly could go Holmgren, um, but 
they'd have to they'd have to move somebody they'd have to move grant they'd have to move bagley you know which is which is feasible but um for for fit i would say ivy uh for best overall player i mean you you definitely can make an argument that holmgren or uh uh banchero are better um if you're going for best available talent you might go that direction, um, but uh, I, I'm just going to take a guess here right now and just say Jaden Ivy. But uh, I, don't hold me to that. <laughs> uh, basically, what I think is they they need an athletic wing who ca- who can shoot, and uh, Ivy's you know th- three the athleticism is there, um, but uh, is he a point guard? Uh, you know his playmaking is kind of shaky. So um, I think he's more of a two guard uh, who can who can play point guard, um, and actually that's kind of the way he was used at Purdue. Um, but uh, shooting shooting is certainly you know he's definitely improved, uh, but he's still not a knockdown shooter. Um, but you know, given the way the talent falls out in this draft, it, it might be the best direction for Detroit to go. No, I think that's a good selection, especially in the sense I think that Jaden Ivey would play well with Cade. I don't think he would, even though he can be on the ball, and we've seen his on-ball dynamicness, uh, dynamicness at Purdue, he's shown that he doesn't need to play and make every single possession, and nor is he ready to play and make every single possession. Cade is obviously ready to do that. So having those two sort of complement each other, especially with Ivy being the dynamic athlete and K being more surgical in, in terms of facilitating and making decisions, that might be your backcourt in the future. Quite quite the backcourt at that. Rich, I, have a, I had a question for you about Detroit. You know, I, I think that the Ivy pick would fit well with K, but what do you think that means for Killian Hayes? Because, I mean, he's only 20, he's two years in, but yeah, yeah, I, he's not, he's trending flat if not down probably for a lot of people so right yeah that's what yeah that's what i'm worried about you know i always was worried about his athleticism and his shooting Mm -hmm. and um these these are still issues that we were worried about on draft day uh two years ago so um you know detroit uh you you can't you can't be in the basement all the time and 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 just wait on a guy just because you you know, you're invested in him, but they're not really invested in him. It's not like he has a yeah. max contract or something. He's still on his rookie exactly. contract. So I don't think you could turn away a guy like Ivy uh, because you already have Kill- Killian Hayes. Killian, excuse me. Not, Gil- not Gilligan. <laughs> <laughs> Gilligan Hayes. Yes. <laughs> the way he's been playing. That's, his, that's his brother. Gilligan. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they, they should call him Gilligan as he starts performing. Then they'll start. Then he can be called Killian after that. Yeah, man, I, I don't know. I wasn't really high on him two years ago, and every time I watch him, I'm just like, yeah, man, you were a seventh pick. Maybe my NBA dreams aren't dead yet, guys. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he he played well. <laughs> he played well at a high level. It's you yeah. know, it's always hard to judge. You know, players you know, coming, you know, out internationally because, you know, every league is different and um, it's just, it's really hard to assess, but uh, you know, I, I, I thought he was going to be a steady player, just like Giddy. Um, I think, you know, there's some ser- similarities there. I like Giddy better, um, but um, yeah, the, you know, the, the lack of athleticism is something, you know, that sometimes can be hard to overcome. Um so yeah. So moving on to OKC, uh, TJ, what do you? Uh, I know they uh, they are definitely in the midst of the process. What do you see uh, this team doing? Yeah. So for Oklahoma City, they obviously have a lot of draft picks, not just for this year, but for many years down the line up until 2027. So they're obviously in the long game, and they're trying to hit on the biggest star, trying to find someone that will be the biggest star to complement with Shea if he even stays for that long, because eventually I think Shea Gilders will get tired of waiting um, for the process that's happening at Oklahoma City. But in terms of needs that I feel are true, looking at their depth chart, I think they would want a big for the future. I think having a a reliable two-way center, someone that can shut down and rim protect, as well as be someone that is viable offensively, that would be really cool to complement with the playmaking and the scoring of Shea and Josh uh, yeah, Josh Giddy, um, respectively. So guys that I would look for 
if it happens to fall out this way, if a Paolo Boncaro is available, if a Chet Holmgren is available, even, and this may sound crazy, but I might be a bit higher than most, even Jalen Duran. I think Duran's upside, mm -hmm. we saw a, a little bit of the glimpse of it towards the end of the regular season where is his, is his uh, peak optimization just as good as a Paolo Boncaro? Obviously very different players, but if he becomes a really great rim protector alongside, has the passing that's Bam out of bio ish and doing handoffs and being an awesome roller to the rim and can shoot a, a 12, 15 foot like a DeAndre Ayton type. I think that's just as good, or better than a Paolo Boncaro who has his athleticism limitations. And also, I think, again, they just want to hit on a star. And who knows if the wild card of a Shaden Sharp, for example, is that type of star that they want to hit on. He, he obviously didn't see him at Kentucky. He didn't play a single uh, game at, of college basketball. However, being 6'6", being as dynamic an athlete, I think he's he sort of, and this is funny because obviously we watch Minnesota in the playoffs. Is he as talented as an Anthony Edwards type? Obviously, again, much less information on him. And I'm not going to act like I've seen a lot of his high school tape. But from what I've read, Shaden Sharp is that level of athlete, is a wing, and can do more than just get to the basket. He can also has a solid jump shot or at least a projectable shot off the dribble. But, yeah, I say all that to say, I think if I was Oklahoma City, I'll still lean towards the big, especially if one of the bigs that we think are one of the top three or four players in the draft is available. And in this case, I probably would lean towards Chet Holmgren. Obviously, his physical, uh, his body, his frame is not not the most ideal for NBA players, and we just have not seen that type of player before. But I just have enough confidence in his overall toughness alongside with his highest skill level as someone that can dribble, pass, and shoot at seven feet, seven one, with a seven five wingspan, maybe even longer than that. And I think he's not going to be uh, gaining 20, 30 pounds, but I can see him getting to 215 pounds and be just fine. I don't think someone that has to be over 230 to play the four slash five position, especially if they are skilled enough like Chet is. So if I'm Oklahoma City, I'm going to get a Chet Holmgren type who can do everything on the court as well as doesn't take away the ball from a Shea Gilgis or Josh Giddy. Because who knows, Josh Giddy can also play a small ball power forward. I know he obviously can facilitate and play point guard, but do you want someone of his athleticism being the main ball handler? And I think him paired with a Chet, I think that can work. So that's that's sort of what I'm leaning towards for number four. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> it would kind of be funny if if there are uh, if he's on the court with Poco at the same time, bunch of bunch of arms and legs just. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know it's kind of funny because um, you know you you could certainly make uh, an argument that uh, you know there's there's similarities between the two. So yeah, Poco, it's just so that, Poco, Poco's been a disappointment at this point. Yeah, it's just that Chet's a thousand times more talented and better than Poku, in my opinion, um, right. just in terms of everything that he can do, especially on defense. It's not even a question Absolutely. about yeah. defensive yeah. ability. Um, right. Also, he has the switchability to guard people that aren't just bigs, but also wings. I think maybe not the top end wings, but at least wings that are uh, above average scores and stay in front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, TJ, I like your point on Chet. I think a lot of people are going to look at his physical profile and, you know, he gets made fun of a lot. You know, you go on Twitter and everyone talks about how he's too skinny to this. But, I mean, I think, like, the, the skill is there. And, you know, skill is skill is what it is. And seven feet, seven one is what it is. You put them together. I think there's a, a definitely a usable basketball player there. I mean, for all the, for all the you know, crap he got for one, you know, he got dunked on by Dern. Like, he did fall out of that game, but he did have nine points, nine boards, and four blocks. I mean, he's, you know, almost a double-double of four blocks on almost 60% shooting. You know, there's something there. No, 100%. 100%. I think Sam Presti would be ecstatic if somehow he falls to number oh, four. Yeah. <laughs> so thrilled. Or he'll just trade him for, like, ten more picks. But <laughs> yeah, who knows Straight what he's going to do. Straight he'll back. trade Chet for, like, six first-rounders mm -hmm. and 30-38 or something. 100%. That, that's also in the cards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if no one else has comments, I can move on to the fifth pick, which is actually still on me for Indiana. And uh, Indiana, I'm not used to seeing them this high in the draft, to be honest. So I'm like, huh, what do they need? What could what they what could they use in this sort of spot? Um, so what I'm thinking if I'm Indiana, 
you have Tyrese Halliburton. That's the player you want to build around. I'm not sure if he'll be your number one if you're at a, like trying to get to a championship level team, but he'll at least be number two, maybe three if you're like you find two other really great players. But I think in terms of what they would want, I, I would want someone that has more dynamic driving ability. I love Tyrese Halliburton. He's he's proven me wrong in so many different ways as an off the dribble scorer, as someone that can create his own shot. But he still is not the greatest at getting to the free throw line slash just getting to the, to the the nook and cranny of the defense and finding the angle to finish through contact. Maybe he'll get there, but he just doesn't have that, and I'm not going to assume that he will have that. And also, I would prefer him just to be more of a perimeter base player in terms of shooting as well as floaters and things of that nature. So if they can get a dynamic driver, penetrator, another shot creating talent to complement, I uh, excuse me, to complement Tyrese Halliburton, to complement a Miles Turner who's obviously a stretch five, I would, I would look at Shaden Sharp. I know that's high for someone that we haven't seen play a game of college basketball, and is coming into the NBA where he'll have a huge learning curve. But from what I've read, from what I've watched of his clips. He seems to be that grade A driver, that grade A finisher, someone that can create his own shot. And also, I'm also assuming that Indiana is not trying to make noise in the playoffs next year. I wouldn't personally, if I'm Indiana, the Eastern Conference looks extremely uh, dangerous. So I wouldn't want to try to make my biggest push, even though you'll probably get uh, a healthy TJ Warren potentially and guys would be hungry to want to win. So I'm choosing Shaden Sharp because I think at this point, he would probably have the highest upside. And that if you pair someone that can be an Anthony Edwards type of talent and product with a Tyrese Halliburton, with a Duarte, with a Buddy Heald, who I think is most is maximized as a six man instead of a starting shooting guard, I think that, I think that could be really deadly if I'm Indiana. TJ, um, to my knowledge, Sharp still hasn't declared, and there's still somewhat of a debate whether he's eligible. Um, though I think the last thing we heard from ESPN that he is eligible, but, um, I don't think anyone official has said that he is. So let's assume, um, and of course, Calipari said that he was going to be with the team next year. So, but for whatever that's worth, but let's just assume he's not in this draft. Um, uh, would you? I would think the the guys that they would probably be looking at would be Ivy if he's available, Duran, or maybe Matherin. Um, would you agree with that? The next best thing would be Jaden Ivy. Obviously, we see his dynamic ability to get to the basket and just be the better athlete than anyone on the court. Right. Um, he's older. He's twenty now. He's obviously leaving as a sophomore, which is not super old. It's just older. Um, but yeah, Ivy would be next if if Indiana wants to be more safe and not take that sort of dynamic driver that's not as polished, then I, I guess, and I wouldn't do this at all, but I can see Indiana sort of leaning towards an older pros- prospect because they already did that with with the uh, Chris Duarte type. Right. I can see them just trying to get, like, just give me someone that's legitimate, that's going to give me 16 points per game and Keegan Murray or Johnny Davis type. I wouldn't personally do it, but that's I wouldn't be upset or wouldn't be shocked because that's more their track record of finding the older prospects that are more right. likely to give them production early on. And what would make Ivy an even better fit is uh, apparently Malcolm Brogdon. There's been a lot of talk about him being traded. Uh, and if you look over that roster, it's, it's not, uh, it's not overflowing with athleticism. So again, Ivy would be a nice boost uh, to that team in terms of speed and quickness and so forth. Um, so moving on, uh, I looked into Portland and what a mess they are. Um, uh, the, I don't know when, uh, Damian Lillard made his claim that he wanted to stay in Portland for the rest of his career. He knew the team was going to look like this at the end of the season. Um, when you really look at this team, I mean, beside Lillard, who's going to be 32 next year. Anthony Simons and good player, nice player. Uh, to me, be uh, like ideal, you know, six man kind of guy could come in and play both guard spots. But you have Josh Hart again, good player, but not a star. Uh, you have Nurkic, who's uh, a free agent at the end of the season and has been bothered by a ton of injuries. 
And other than that, no, nah, Rich, you're forgetting one, mate. What? Jo- Joe Ingles. Don't forget Joe Ingles is a uh, well, Joe. Deep. Joe is Joe but is 43 he's... years old and coming off an ACL injury. So um, good, I love Joe. I love Joe. Slow, slow mo, slow mo. Joe doesn't even need the knee. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna put him in a wheelchair in the corner. Yeah, he can hit three, corner. run the pick and roll. Good defender in a wheelchair. <laughs> For some reason, I can actually imagine him playing in a wheelchair for some reason. <laughs> uh, oh, I love Joe. But uh, again, you know, even if he comes back 100 um, percent, you know, he, he's in, he's um, I don't know how old Joe is, but he's he's got to be in his mid to mid late 30s. 30s right? Mid 30s. Yeah. He's like 34, maybe something like that. Right. So uh, and again, not a star player, you know, a complimentary player. So what do they have to they basically what I'm saying here is. This team has to take the best player available. Um, and the way, you know, our if you want to call it like a mock draft, uh, I, I would say, you know, um, they could go anywhere uh, with this pick. And uh, on my board, you know, the way with all the players we talk about, the one player we haven't uh, is Matherin um, or, or Duran if they're not going to sign Nurkic. Um, so that the, to me, they would be the two players they'd be looking at this spot. Um, and it all depends on what you want. I mean, Matherin's kind of an all around player. Um, and Duran, we don't know how he's going to be offensively, but I think we pretty fairly safe to say that he's going to be a really good defensive player. Uh, so I would tend to lean toward Matherin, but uh, Duran's probably uh a harder commodity to come by, uh, you know, in terms of size and athleticism, but, but uh, yeah, I'll say Matherin uh, probably here, but uh, I, I really don't understand. Uh, this team's obviously not thinking, you know, what's best for, uh, uh, you know, Damian Lillard um, because they are, have a long way to go. So I have a question I want to throw to the group. Do do you guys think that Dame Lillard is actually going to retire a, a Blazer at this point, or do you think the whole loyal to the soil mantra is going to run real thin when they win twenty games and don't make the playoffs? Well, no one's going to blame him. Yeah, yeah, he's not going to be criticized for it except for in Portland. You know, yeah. I think oh, Portland has games. to Portland has to use his star power as an opportunity to get a lot back for trading him away. That's the way I think it has to unfold there. Or to attract other free agents. But no one wants to live in Portland. <laughs> no, no, I, I no, was just curious. No I just, you know, I Dame's from my neck of the woods. So, you know, I've always been a Dame supporter just because he's from the Bay Area. And I love how his career has turned out. But can you really win at a super high level when your best player, like unquestioned, no supporting cast is a 6'2 guard who doesn't defend? And is coming off the first kind of really injury riddled career, like season of his career. Like, can you can yeah. you really win with him? I just don't know anymore. I mean, you look at Dame's resume, and yeah, he's got some great game winners, but I think he's got five or six All Star appearances, a couple All NBA, and that's about it. Like, I think at some point you got to realize that he's just not you. You can't hitch the wagon to him and say take us to the promised land. Not in the you West. Know, I I think everybody involved is probably wish they could rewind about you know five months, yeah. and. Uh, and trade him to the Sixers, and yeah, you know that would that would have been the best thing. You know, can he carry a team? I mean, no one player can carry a team. I mean, you need we know you need three right. really really good players, and um, they have one, and he's thirty, going to be thirty two years old, and so yeah, so best player available certainly makes uh, a ton of sense here, and. Um, so, yeah. The only thing I'll say very quickly about Bennett and Matherin is that I think people underrate his upside in terms of what his peak outcome could be. So I don't just think he can be an awesome just three and D player. He obviously is a really good shooter, but I, th- I think I saw some passing feel from him oh, in definitely. terms of get to the basket and dish it out to a, for a kick out. So I think if I'm Portland, I'm not just viewing him as someone that can just fit nicely next to Dame as a shooter, but I would want to nurture and try to see if he has a bit more of scoring slash shot creation ability. And he also has the athleticism to be not just your average shooter. 
No, I agree. I think he, he's a potential future star for sure. He can, he can do just about everything. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have no problem with them taking him here. Uh, and that's why, you know, kind of that all around ability, uh, versus Duran's potential to be, you know, kind of a one dimensional player is kind of why I gave Mather in the nod. So moving on, Hugh, uh, <laughs> yep. Sacramento, which has a lot better weather than Portland. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, how do you see this potential, this, uh, the Kings who are potentially in this spot year after year? How do you see them uh, going in the draft? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rich, for assigning me the dumpster fire that is the Sacramento Kings. I think uh, <laughs> it, it is exciting to be in the put in this position, though, and just sort of maybe give them a little bit of direction here. Uh, looking through their – going through their roster was tough. Um, obviously, they have Dar- De'Aaron Fox, Sabonis as their two star players, I guess you could say. Harrison Barnes is amongst that. And then after those three, there is a significant drop-off in, in – star talent. I think Davian Mitchell is the only quality young player that they have who I think Kings fans should be excited about. Um, but I think they're in the same position in where they need the best player available. Um, but I think ultimately, I think the Kings should go a different direction in the draft. And with Sabonis and Fox's future, I think it's time for the De'Aaron Fox uh, tenure as a Sacramento King to end. And I think if I'm Sacramento coming up to this draft, I'm packaging Fox and potentially that the this seventh pick, if they land at seven, for someone who can contribute to them right away. Because I don't think many Kings fans or anyone around the Kings organization wants to keep this rebuild going any much longer. Um, so what got, are you suggesting they trade for a veteran or? Well, I mean, if you could put, even if they got rid of Fox and, and just send him away somewhere else for more picks, I think that might be the way to go to get more like a, a number of picks in the first round for some young talent. Um, I, I don't think like obviously bringing a vet in right away is going to be the key, but I just think they got to just outside of Davion Mitchell, they don't have much at all. Sabonis, I don't think wants to be there long-term. And I think, yeah, like I said, De'Aaron Fox, that something needs to change. So I could see them packaging Fox somewhere around the draft day, draft there, something around there to try and make some movement because I think they just need to make a major change. They need a major shakeup. Um, but if they are, if they choose to keep that pick and draft around seven, I mean, there, there should still be some quality talent. I think Duran could be really good for them. Um, obviously, being that bookend as a five that they could rely upon. They already have Rashawn Holmes, but he's not going to be an all-star or anything like that in his career. Um, and then I also thought AJ Griffin and Matherin, if Matherin's still on the board, those are guys that you could put alongside Davion Mitchell you know, strong athletic wings, sort of build a, a, a good backcourt behind those two. Um, unfortunately, the Kings were fleeced this year out of their best player on the roster, which we discussed earlier, Halliburton. So they need to do make some major changes. And yeah, I, I think if I'm running the Kings, I don't think Darren Fox is in the Kings jersey next season. I think that that's run its course. It's time to move on. It's trying to try, take a different direction for this rebuild because it's been stalling or even worse going backwards the last couple of years you know what's amazing when we look at some of these teams like orlando and in others you know there's a lot of pieces that you're still not ready to give up on and you know you you still have hope for like a killian i did it again uh, killian. killian killian hayes you know or you know uh or, you know, you know who I'm talking about, uh, or say an RJ Hampton, you know, this team doesn't have any of that except mm-hmm. beside Davion Mitchell, who was, who was one of the older players in the draft last year. Mm-hmm. So they really don't have uh, like, where did their draft picks go? Because we know, <laughs> we know they've been in the picking in the lottery forever. And yet you look at this roster, you're like, what the heck? Mo yeah, Harkless, yeah. Alex Len, um, yep. You know, goodness gracious. As a Warriors fan, we love it. We love having a punching bag just a few miles away, <laughs> like you know, a couple hours up the road. It's great. But I, I, I do kind of agree with you. Like, I, I think it's getting to the point, and it, it's probably hard for a Kings fan to say this because they've been rebuilding since, you know, 2001, basically. But, I mean, at some point, it's like, is, I love Sabonis as a player. I love – like, are you going anywhere with De'Aaron Fox and Sabonis? Like, really? 
Sabonis is probably out of there when his contract's up. I, I just I think maybe that might be the move is either try to try try to get some more picks and and really blow like just blow this thing up because I think there's pieces on this roster that teams want. Harrison Barnes is a quality player. Mm-hmm. Sabonis is a quality. I mean, two time All Star. Fox is one of those borderline All Star guards. I mean, DiVincenzo is probably has some value somewhere. I just feel like you know if you're gonna blow it up, just blow it up because you just gave away your best asset anyways. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay, so we have uh, New Orleans at eight. Hugh, this is via the Lakers. Um, so, at least them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you know, my first question to you is something to consider. Um, is uh, I doubt this would happen, but um, yeah, this is probably I'll I'll say it. But now, the more and more I think about it, this, is dumb because he's on a rookie contract. But I was going to say, is it time for New Orleans to move on from Zion? I mean, might my, my, maybe maybe now before they have to give him big money and then you know pay him you know forty million dollars a year to you know to watch him on the bench. Um, I don't know. Maybe why he still has value. Maybe it is time. No. Yeah, that was something I was uh, playing around with the other day in my head too. How, how do they assess? Because obviously they've had a successful season this year, and we haven't seen Zion once. So, right. I mean, they've got a they've got some nice. Thing. I don't think I think Zion's too good of a player to just ship away. Still, I mean, he's we saw. I think it was last season when he played a majority of the year where he can obviously contribute and very is very productive as a player when he's healthy, when he's in shape, when he's you know um, able to get up and down consistently. Um, so I don't think they're ready to move on from him yet. I think New Orleans should be doing everything in their power to keep Zion on this roster um, because they might regret that significantly down the line if, uh, if they do. Drew, you want to say something before I get into some notes on New Orleans? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think it's early to cut bait on a guy like that. My only concern is I think the issues with Zion are completely – they're just not basketball-related. I just question if he wants to be there. I mean, everyone was hyped up about these videos of him dunking. I'm like, he he's a 6'6 NBA All-Star. I would hope he could dunk. Like, why are people going ballistic about this? Like, this is not impressive to me. And he just – he still looks heavy. So, I think he was right. Talent-wise, as a basketball player, how do you cut bait on a guy who I think averaged 24 and 7 last year? But if he doesn't want to be there, I mean, how many times do we see it with these all stars? James Harden forces his way out, Carmelo Anthony forces his way out, and it you know it burns these franchises. You have something good going with this coach, with these other players. I don't think it'd be insane to go, hey, maybe we do get rid of Zion, we get some value back, you know, and you might be able to rip off a team because I think the Zion hype. If he doesn't lose weight, if he doesn't, his career's in trouble. Yeah, because he's got foot problems. And that all comes down to the weight. Yep. <laughs> Kiss of death for big players like that. When yeah. your feet go, yeah. it's over. So yeah. So I, I, I mean, of course, this is not a, a secret. Other teams are aware of this as well. But there still might be somebody who really covets him. If 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 it's, if it's my team, I'm 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 talking to other teams about getting rid of him before mm-hmm. before he doesn't have any value. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know about that so much, Rich, but I think it's going to be really interesting to see what they do here because they're in that funny position now where they have a, a pretty solid team and they have this eighth pick. And I guess we obviously could see them take young talent again, but I could also see them potentially trading that pick for a player who can come in and help them be even better next year to prove to Zion that we're, we're coming out of this rebuild and we're ready to make a run at some deep playoff pushes. Um like uh, going through, they, I mean, we watched them twice now this past week in the play in. They have talent. They have plenty of talent on this roster. Brandon Ingram, CJ McCollum, Jonas Valanciunas, Devontae Graham, Larry Nanja Jr., some guys they got in the middle of this year. They nailed the draft last year. Herb Jones, they got him late in the first round. He's been huge for them. Um, and then Alvarado, they've just signed him um, to a, some minimum money, but for a number of years. And he's obviously an incredible energy player, brings a great spark for that team. So they're doing all of this without seeing Zion. Um, everyone that I just mentioned is under contract next season as well. So it's not like they're losing any of these pieces this offseason coming up. So I think they're in a position where they they want to just take the best player available here. It's probably going to be someone that's going to be coming off the bench for them, obviously, as we're a bit later in the, in the lottery now. But they just need to keep finding winning players. They've done that last year. And if they keep doing that, I think they're on a track record that is trending in the right direction. Um, 
Something I'm going to mention a bit later with some of the other teams, I think now that we're a bit later in the lottery, I think teams now are going to start to look to stockpile wings, versatile wings. That seems to be the way, the key to success in the NBA. I mean, you look at the model Phoenix has, and they have a, a three or four really solid three and D wings who get smart basketball players that contribute to winning. And I think teams are going to start to go that way too. They want to head that direction where they have plenty of versatility to defend and stretch the floor. So I think for them, I'm always terrible at pronouncing his name, but the Baylor wings, so Sohan mm-hmm. could be a really good grab for them at eight. I think he and Herb Jones could have obviously very similar game styles, incredibly versatile guys that you can throw out there. You just want a number of players, I think, now that you can throw on elite wing scorers just to wear them down. You need a lot of those guys to be really successful in the playoffs. Um, I think he could be someone they have their eyes on here at the eighth pick, potentially through the Lakers, just because, you know, they're maybe even a point guard, but I don't know if there's that point guard yet this this high in the draft that everyone is scrambling for. Um so that, I think that could be a part just because Devontae Graham, you know, is more of a score first point guard. And they obviously have a lot of scoring now already with Brandon Ingram and CJ McCollum. So maybe they want to move away from the Devontae Graham show in a sense. But yeah, I think New Orleans has built themselves into a great position even so recently as a couple of years ago where there wasn't much respect around the league for them at all. They've turned it on the back half of this year. And I'm just excited to see where they go. I'm excited to watch them through this playoffs and obviously what they're going to do with this with this eighth selection, courtesy of Anthony Davis and the Los Angeles Lakers. You you you, uh, you said Sohan, but you had mentioned uh, A.J. Griffin um, mm-hmm. before. Uh, uh, what would you think about them taking him? I, I agree. He, he could be another great fit. I think I'd probably lent more towards Sohan just because he's that touch taller. He's like 6'8", six, 6'9", six, as opposed to Griffin, 6'6", six, six, um, as like a wing defender who could defend two through four. Mm-hmm. I don't know if AJ Griffin might necessarily be able to defend fours in the NBA. Uh, maybe if there were other teams were going small ball, but yeah, I mean, that's a good idea though, because obviously Herb Jones and Sohan are pretty similar build wise um, and skill set wise. So maybe AJ Griffin might be a better fit to be a touch smaller, you know, scoring option, but also a great defender at the guard position. Okay. Okay. So um, moving on, uh, Drew, anybody else have any comments before we move on? Okay. Thank you, Lakers. Thank you. <laughs> we'll take all, take all your capital. We love it. So, so the next pick uh, is uh, Falls of San Antonio, um, and they also have picks 20 uh, from the Raptors and 25 from Boston. So, Drew, uh, what do you think uh, San Antonio is going to do? Um, they seem to be shaping up with a lot of nice pieces, but uh, seem to need something just to get them over the edge. Yeah, I, that's, I kind of was going to go kind of where he was going here about how I think this is the part where they're going to go try to find whatever wing that they can that can maybe not be a superstar, but can elevate to a really high level starter. I mean, when you look at their roster, you have DeJounte Murray, you know, we don't know what his ceiling is yet. Did we see it this season? Can he take it to another level? But after that, I mean, on the wings, you've got guys like Josh Primo, Devin Vassell, Josh Richardson, Lonnie Walker. They're great players, but that's kind of all they are is just players. They're not, I think, big needle movers. Um, You know, I think their second best player might be Keldon Johnson and he's an undersized power forward right now at six, six. So, I was looking at it kind of two schools of thought. Uh, you guys mentioned AJ Griffin, so I, I'm not going to go into super detail. I think if the Spurs want to take a swing at the guy with the most potential, he might be the one if he falls there, just as a shooter, a scorer, someone who can compliment DeJounte, who is a little bit more of a do everything um, point guard, someone who can go get a shot at any level. Um, I was, you know, really bouncing this pick around because there's so many of these wings. And so two other guys that came up for me were Johnny Davis out of Wisconsin or maybe even an Ochai Abaji. Uh, it might seem a little high for Ochai. I know a lot of teams have it maybe a little bit later in the lottery, but I think there's two schools of thought around this team. The Spurs ranked first in two-point field goals made and second in attempts uh, this season. And like I said, their starting wing rotation is okay at best. I, if they want to keep that you know in-between game alive and well, I could definitely see a Johnny Davis fitting here as a guy who thrives in the mid-range. I mean, his efficiency wasn't great, but I mean, he was Wisconsin's offense. So in a system where maybe they take a little bit of pressure off of him, maybe he's more of a six man. I think Johnny Davis could thrive here. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, you know, they were 25th in three point attempts, but they were 18th in three point percentage. So 
bottom half of the league, bottom third of the league in taking threes, but relatively average in making them. And I think Ochai Abaji screams, and we've talked about him before, like three and D player, like a guy who can come in, shoot at a really solid clip, and then get down in a stance and defend along the perimeter. I don't think his ceiling's super high, but, you know, depending on maybe what the Spurs feel like they're going to do in free agency, they might view him as a player that can come in, instantly get minutes. He's gone through the progression of a college career, knows what it's like to be a role player, knows what it's like to be the number one guy. Um, I personally think A.J. Griffin would be a great swing for them here. I think the Spurs have long been a team that values, you know, taking the safe road and finding guys with a really solid floor. But you need talent to win in this league. It's a superstar driven league. And DeJounte is going to need some help at some point because you're asking him to go out there and win with guys who just are just guys at the end of the day. So I think A.J. Griffin has the highest upside. But I could definitely see a Johnny Davis or even an Ochai um, slide in this spot. But I think they need to go find a wing who can who can help out DeJounte. Yeah, if I'm a draft prospect, I would cross my fingers if I didn't care about the city. But if I just want to go to the best situation for development, yeah, San Antonio is the spot. Is the spot. I want to go to Sacramento. I don't want to go to New Orleans. I want to go be coached by Greg Pop. I want to be in that development track. And that would be immensely helpful for – AJ Griffin type mm-hmm. who has a lot of talent who's shooting the lights out, but it's not, he doesn't put all the pieces together or he's not polished enough slash uh, it's going to take some development. If he goes to a team that is not keen on development and puts too much pressure on him too soon, then that's when I think he'll be more likely to bust or fail. So no, I, oh, I definitely yeah. love that, that San Antonio pick for them. Yeah. I just, I just think that it's, it's a great, because all three of these guys have some level of weakness that I, you know, I mentioned, I think, and I think San Antonio is the perfect place to help them enhance that or at least cover it up, you know? So we'll see. I like AJ here, but I don't know. The Spurs seem to kind of always go a little bit safer. So I think they might go with the older Davis, older Ochai, but I don't think they can really go wrong. Their other two picks are going to be interesting too. They did get Josh Primo though. They did get Primo. Hey, maybe they switch it up. And, and that's what I was gonna. I was gonna bring up. Um, I, I kind of had to disagree. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I don't want to put Devin Vassell and Primo and Lonnie Walker in the same category as Josh Richardson. Um, I don't think any of those three have, especially Primo, have come close to their potential. Um, maybe Walker is getting there, and maybe what we've seen from Walker is what he is, but. Um, I still still think, you know, there, there's upside for Vassell and there's uh, definitely upside for Primo. And so if I'm the way I look at that roster, you know, you got Doug McDermott starting at the four who actually didn't finish the season because of injury. And then, you know, behind him is a bunch of, you know, not very good players. Um, and, and, and the way our little mock is going here, no one's taking Durant. Um but I, I, I would tend to go for a big um, thinking that you don't want Doug McDermott in your starting lineup. Um, now, I don't uh, Durin know. Guy. I, 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 I don't know. I think Duran, I just, I don't know how Duran fits. And I mean, I think physically it's there. I just don't know. I think they're okay. the best player available. And I think right. that's well, it, if that's, if that's the case, I can see it, but I still think Duran is the best player available. One guy I think they might think about is Kendall Brown from Baylor. Um, you know, a guy who's still really young, uh, definitely has, definitely has athleticism, um, you know, shows potential on more so on the defensive end than the offensive end. But, uh, I don't think, you know, we've seen enough of him to, to say that he's only going to be a defensive player. So, uh, 19 years old. So, um, yeah, I think that those are the two guys I would be looking at next pick. Uh, would be Washington and Hugh, you, you have another uh, stellar team to uh, analyze here. Uh, Give us what you think about the wizards. Yeah. The wizards. Um, I mean, that I just discussed about the Pelicans before. I think the wizards are a little bit behind the Pelicans in regards to what they have already, but I wouldn't say they have no talent on the roster. Um, No, I agree. Obviously obviously Bradley Beal is a high quality player. They got Chris Porzingis now who can do some nice things when healthy. Uh, Kuzma proved that he's a good player in the right spot this year and I really like uh, Rui Hachimura I'm a big fan of him I think he's going to continue to grow and to be a really solid player in the NBA and then in regards to young talent I mean Hachimura technically you could still say he's very young talent but Daniel Gafford has shown flashes of being a really good 
strong, versatile big. Danny Avdia and then Kispert was a solid shooter in his first year. So I think he'll continue to, to grow uh, for the Wizards. But I think, like I said, with the Pels, they, they should try to add depth and length and stockpile these wing positions. If, if Duran is still available at 10, I think they have to take him now. Um, or even take a risk on Sharp, Shaden Sharp. Um, I know that is a bit of a risk. We haven't seen him play in a while, but I think those are two players that the Wizards could definitely get excited about roster with some big upside and, and putting some nice, some nice pieces around Bradley Beal. Uh, they don't really have any good point guard depth is what I noticed. Right now, they only have Ish Smith and, and Raul Neto on the roster who are both, you know, past first point guards, um, sort of playmaking guys. And Neto is a free agent this coming summer. So I think there's a chance he might be gone. I think Dyson Daniels is someone we haven't mentioned yet. Um, an Australian kid, G League Ignite team, who has a, plenty of upside. Uh, he's got good size at a point guard position. I think he's someone they could definitely give a lot of attention to. I don't know if he's quite ready to go at 10, but if some of his workouts go well with teams in the build up to the draft, I think Dyson Daniels could be someone they are looking at. Johnny Davis is also, if he's available in that category, I think scoring, they need scoring. They obviously need help everywhere across the board. I wouldn't say any position on their, on their team is uh, one that is untouchable. Bradley Beal can obviously be moved around a little bit, but yeah, I think Duran, if, if he is on the board, they should just try to get a, a dominant inside presence for this team because they have some solid guards. They have some solid wings. Um, maybe maybe Oshay Abaji, but I think they, they can go a number of directions. They're probably just going to take that best available play approach, but I do think they should be willing to take a bit of a risk and maybe Shaden Sharp is a guy that they could see as blossoming big in the future and, and someone they might want on their squad. Yeah, no, 100%. I think, like you said, Wizards can go multiple different directions. Uh, I do want to give some love or, sh- like, real quick, give a shout-out to the Kyle Kuzma, uh, I mm-hmm. guess, player on the Wizards. Kuzma sort of impressed me in terms of his overall game and not just being a gunner but can rebound, can still dribble and make plays for himself and others. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I think I w- if I was the Wizards, like you said, nothing wrong going looking at Shaden Sharp or a wing type instead of what you're what the I guess the power forwards or centers position how you have Gafford you still have Przingis uh, under contract I already talked about Kuzma so yeah I think the Wizards have a lot of options and yeah they do have some talent they don't have nobody so yeah, yeah. I, I like the Wizards spot uh, I and, agree and- yeah I I I I do uh, I think what's missing is uh, a point guard. Um, you know, if uh, now, of course, Beal's a free agent, so that's could be a problem. Uh, but assuming they keep Beal, uh, a point guard, and probably, I mean, it, you know, maybe this is a good lo- uh, landing spot for Fox because really, you know, the talent on this team is, you know, guy kind of guys that are in their prime. Um, and, and they do have some younger talent but they're kind of more on the mature younger like kisper abia uh, hachimura they're all not the they're not like 19 year old guys this is kind of a team built you know for now uh if 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 they sign beal and got a, a real point guard so um yeah that's you're right rich beal is bill next year has a player option going into next season so it's his choice if he decides to opt into that he'll be making 36 million dollars next year so I think I see a reality in which he will take that extra year in Washington and, and assure himself another 30 plus million dollars uh, to be on that roster. But yeah, I think they're, they're in a pretty good spot here. I mean, if the Wizards, if they get lucky with their percentage and they fall into the top, you know, if they get landed six or landed five or landed four, then they're, they're in the money right there. They can be a really exciting opportunity for them. So, I mean, landing at 10, they, they got a chance of getting someone that could be really good, but they, if they get lucky, they could really make some noise, I think, and really build this team really quickly. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, that's me. All righty. So, TJ, how about your hometown Knicks? Um, how do you think they're – what What do you think they're uh, looking at? Yeah, so uh, you already said it. I'm a Knicks fan, so I thought about this pretty, pretty critically. And I'm pretty certain that they won't do what I'm going to do um, because I'm just realistic. But yeah, if I'm the Knicks, uh, the timeline, the timeline that I'm thinking of is not trying to be a championship contender, not trying to get revenge and get back to the fourth seed like they were last year. 
I'm just trying to do whatever I can to empower and develop RJ Barrett. And that's it. Everyone else, I wouldn't say it's on the table, but everyone else is is not in the priority. You know, I love I like Obi Top and I like Emmanuel quickly. Um, but they're they're good role players, maybe okay starters at best. Um, so yeah, I'm looking at a bit more long-term outlook when making this decision. I'm also not foreseeing bringing back Julius Randle. That's in our power or in the Knicks power. I would want somehow a trade. Uh, I just don't see how a Julius Randle led team is going to work. Slash, I'm not sure if Julius Randle can be effective as a number two, at least in this Knicks situation. Um, so yeah, that those are the two caveats that are not in my control. But I'm going to assume those things when I make my pick. So I'd love the Knicks to look at two way players, obviously. Coach Thibodeau, he loves defense more than anything else. You know, he has evolved as an offensive mind. But I know for certain that he's not going to drop a non-defender uh, at number 11 if they keep this pick. Um, I also wouldn't mind someone that can play with R.J. Barrett. Like I said, I think they should keep in mind whoever they whoever they grab, they have to be someone that doesn't get in the way. They have to be someone that makes R.J. better or helps him continue developing and getting on the trajectory of being a hopeful all-star if not, and I'm not assuming this, but hopefully a an all NBA type player. So I'm looking at players such as <laughs> Dyson Daniels. Um, and this may catch some people off guard because Dyson Daniels is not the sexy pick, um, but he is someone that has multiple layers to his game. He can do everything except for maybe shoot, and I do want shooting around RJ. However, I do think his playmaking, his defense, his consistency is one that I think he – is arguably was the most consistent player for the G League Ignite players, at least for the ones that were that are draft eligible. Um, I have about six, 11 points, over six rebounds, a few assists, was the main playmaker. I'm also looking at guys that are that have, I guess, solid role player upside, maybe not high upside in terms of being stars, but someone like an Ochai Baji, who we discussed earlier. Um, also, obviously, the Knicks, they don't have a point guard of the future unless you think Emmanuel quickly is that. It certainly isn't Kemba Walker. It certainly isn't Alec Burks, who played a lot of point guard going down the stretch. So if the Knicks want to keep the Kentucky roots alive, they can also go Ty Ty Washington and see if he can he if he can be the next point guard of the future and uh, outplay what he did at Kentucky and be an even better pro player. Uh, but yeah, enough of the options I'm going to. And also, let's say if Benedict Matherin somehow fell, which I don't foresee happening, it's probably the least lo- least likely outcome. I would love Benedict Matherin. I think he can play with RJ. Also, the Canadian connection between him and RJ would be really nice to see and would work, I think. But yeah, the player that I think the Knicks, if I was the Knicks, who I would select, I would pick Dyson Daniels. And again, not something I foresee happening in real life, but I think his overall all-around ability, and I think he can develop a jump jump shot. I think there's been improvement from when I watched him at the FIBA U19 up until his G League Ignite stint so far that he has grown. And I think he can play a little bit of point, maybe not a full-time point guard. I don't think he's that dynamic of a ball handler. But again, I think he can have, uh, or he does have high level of IQ for his age and can see a play ahead and can make the right decision, which is all I want. I just want someone that can make the right decision as well as guard their position. And he can maybe guard not just twos, but also some ones at six foot six. So yeah, mm-hmm. Dyson Daniels from the G League Ignite for the Knicks. All righty. And um anyone have any comments there? Yeah, I want to ask TJ what his thoughts are on Kemba next season in New York. Uh, Kemba, Kemba, I just don't think has juice anymore. And I'm a, he's also from the Bronx. That's I'm a Bronx native myself. So I've rooted extra hard for Kemba Walker because of that connection. And he obviously is an awesome player, awesome college career, awesome time in Charlotte, brief time in Boston. And it looked good at moments. He had a really nice Christmas game for the Knicks when they played against the Hawks when Trey Young was hurt. But yeah, I don't, I don't foresee Kemba being in the plans and either he's gone or he just doesn't play at all or plays very limited time for the next. Yeah. So he's under contract next year, making 9 million. That's the last year on that contract. So you think mm-hmm. they, if they can't get him out of there, they just stash him. You uh, see him as a, as a mentor in the locker room for mean, a Dyson yeah, no, Daniels think, potential. 100%. I a do John, love him. A John Wall guy. <laughs> Kemba's personality. He's definitely not someone that's sulking if he's not getting playing time. When he was benched uh-huh. before he had the opportunity, he was still one of the more uh, 
uh, cheerful players on the bench and cheerful to to everyone's success, not just guys like Randall, but he's also rooting on the players that are taking his minutes. Um, and yeah, and I'm and also assuming that Derrick Rose is healthy. I would much rather Derrick Rose play minutes at the point than uh, Kemba Walker, at least based on what we saw uh, during this entire season that just passed. So yeah, that's the my answer to that question. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. What do you uh, think, Drew? What Drew's still mad at me because I criticized him about San Antonio. Um, <laughs> I think I'm just like you said. I totally agree that they need depth of big. I'm just not a believer in Duran. I think there's I think there's a bit of an overrated nature. Oh, are we going back to San Antonio? <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm not mad. I just think like. <laughs> All right, he's big. Everyone in the NBA is big. Next. San, like, Ant- ne- San Antonio's time on the clock is done. <laughs> it's done when I say it's done, you. The, ES- it's done the ESPN I- crew has thrown it to Adam Silver as he walks to the podium. It's over, Drew. <laughs> what I was going to say about Kemba, it's my understanding that they made some kind of verbal agreement with him to uh, try to trade him uh, in the offseason. So that was my understanding. Um, so, uh, moving on, uh, we have OKC again, back on the clock with number 12. This one's via the Clippers, um, TJ, uh, and they also have pick 30 from the Suns. So, uh, we, uh, you went with Chet, you, you thought that, that, uh, Oklahoma city would, uh, look at Chet Holmgren, um, with this pick, what do you think they'll be looking at? So for the Oklahoma City Thunder at the 12th pick, again, they're stockpiling a lot of talent. And there's still some, I think, some undervalued high upside talent, even at number 12. Maybe not the potential of the Boncaros of the world, the Chet Holmgrens, who I think they should pick if he's available to them at four. However, still looking at the guys that may be undervalued with maybe low floors but high upsides. But for, for the Thunder, I'm looking at guys like Jeremy Sohan. I'm thinking looking at guys like Tari Eason, who, again, have don't have the greatest floors, especially uh, maybe depending on who you talk to about Jeremy Sohan. He's not going to put up a whole bunch of points, but he will defend. He will be active. Uh, same with Tari Eason. He's not a super refined player, but he is able to guard up and be someone that can get to the basket, but may not have the the – the on-ball reps to do that consistently at the NBA level. Um, also thinking of a big, even though you, I picked Chet Holmgren initially, why not get your backup center for the future? I love Jeremiah Robinson Earl, but are we sure that he's, you want him to be your backup five? So maybe looking at a Mark Williams, who I think impressed a lot of people back in the tournament. Um, but for me at 12, if I'm the Thunder, I'll probably go with Sohan. I just love his activity. I think his switchability guarding not just the four position, not just other wings, but also potentially guarding point guards, being someone where we see, and this is obviously very different player, very different stages in their career, but we see in the value of a Herb Jones for the Pelicans, where he's not just guarding wings as a 6'8", 6'9", wing himself, but he's also guarding point guards, guarding off guards. And I think a Jeremy Sohan type, I think could fit that role pretty well. And you're not going to put too much pressure on him to be someone that fills in as a as an immediate starter, but he can put in and play plug minutes when Lou Dort's on the bench and hold his own as a defender. And if he develops a jump shot, which is not a guarantee, I think his jump shot doesn't look bad at all. I think it has a chance. Um, then we can see potentially him in year two, year three, being something where the Thunder may want to have him be a potential starter alongside Sh- uh, Shea and a Josh Giddy type. If if he wasn't available, would you think about his teammate, uh, Kendall Brown, or um, I'm just looking over here, some other guys, uh, Keegan Murray, uh, Walker Kessler, or as you said, Mark Williams, um, out, out of those, would you look for a big, uh, and if so, uh, who would it be? Yeah, so I think it would, would be Mark Williams. And again, in the Thunder position, I'm not looking for the most, uh, the best floor, but a regular ceiling type of player. I think Keegan Murray's really good, but I don't think his ceiling, unless he does something that I don't foresee happening, uh, I don't think his ceiling is that high, at least to the, the liking of a Oklahoma City Thunder team. And I think Mark Williams, 
And I've heard this. I don't want to steal this point, but I remember hearing on a podcast. I just can't remember who said so. But what's the difference in terms of talent or is there is there much of a gap in talent between a Mark Williams and a Jalen Duran, for example, in the sense that Mark Williams, who was is, who is a year older, maybe a year and a half older, because I know Jalen Duran's a young freshman. Is there that much of a gap in terms of talent? Because the physicality, the measurables that Mark Williams has is pretty comparable. His ability to guard the paint and lock down is pretty good, as well as his ability to roll to the basket and finish and be a, a, a vertical spacer. So my, I think Mark Williams would be, I guess, a backup option. My answer to that question would be, I think, I think Duran's more athletic. I think he has more offensive upside. He's already showing more ability to, to, to play from the perimeter than, than Williams has in two seasons. So that would be my answer. Um, I, that's why I like Duran better. I think he has offensive upside that I haven't really seen from Williams other than, you know, the, the pick and roll put back that type of stuff. Neither, yeah, of, them, no. neither of them are really post players. I agree. That's why I even had a team earlier to consider the thunder at number four. think of Jalen Duran because of his, his high ceiling at someone that's, if he's not 18, he's barely 19, for example. Um, it's just that, let's say, a Mark Williams, how much can he become Jer- a Jared Allen type? Right, right. Why, right. Can he, I think he can become that good. Oh, yeah. He, it's yeah. all yeah. the markers. And Jared Allen, he's an all-star caliber player. He had an all-star caliber season last se- or this past season. So that's where I'm thinking of a Mark Williams and his ceiling. Not saying that he's probably going to be better than Jalen Duran, but it's not that much of a difference where – at 12, I'm still thinking of a higher ceiling for a, a Mark Williams. Right. And since hey, I have the Thunder. Who, Sorry, TJ, you finish up. You go ahead. I know. I was going to go to my 30th pick for the Thunder. I was going to say, I totally agree with you. I think Mark Williams can come to be Clint Capella, at least, who's a starting yeah. center for the Hawks. So I just was saying you're, you're spot on. I'm totally on board with you. Yeah, Mark Williams is seven feet tall, too. He's even taller than Clint Capella by a little yeah. bit. He's bigger yeah. than Durant because I think Durant's only 6'10". Yeah, so I'm not sleeping on Mark Williams. His, his ability to play for Duke, uh, and he improved throughout the year as well, which I always rate highly. I think it's it's really impressive. And I think very quickly. I, oh, I was just uh, going to say, and we talked about this before. I think Kessler and Coloco are right there with Williams too. So you got some really nice, you know, right right around this range of the draft, you can start thinking about some nice rim protectors. Yeah, and I think Mark Williams has uh, advantage as a rebounder, too, over the two guys he just mentioned. Um, but, yeah, very quickly, the Thunder also have the 30th pick, and not to spend too much time on the 30th pick if they keep it. Uh, again, just best talent available, someone that may have had a poor season, but they've had a lot they, – they showed in, in younger levels or earlier levels that they are really good. Um, let's say a Patrick Baldwin, but if he falls really low and his tape is just that bad – I, I can easily see the 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 Thunder drooling over swiping him potentially. Why not a JD Davison potentially if he falls to 30th pick? Oh, yeah. I think they would love to have a very spry, athletic, fiery player like a JD Davison. And okay. the last person I considered is also someone I haven't watched a whole lot of tape, but from what I've read in his very sudden surge into draft conversations, Ryan Rollins from Toledo, who I know is being compared to a CJ McCollum type of smooth. Uh, multiple moves type of score, not the greatest three-point shooter, but his jump shot form looks like it should be able to extend pretty easily to beyond the arc, but he has very smooth mechanics, very smooth ball handling. And as a sophomore, looks like he has a bit more untapped potential than may have been noticed earlier in the year. Um, but if I'm the Thunder out of those three players, I'll probably stick with a Patrick Baldwin, someone that's 6'9", that shoots the way he does, no matter how poorly he played at Milwaukee for his dad. I think if he's playing on an NBA team where he has a lot less responsibility and is being set up instead of trying to shot create, that'll be a really nice piece. Uh, just a note on Baldwin. Uh, I tried pretty hard to get him on the show uh, after the season. Actually, it started before the season was over. Um, and the SID there, as far in. The last thing I heard, he had not declared, he had not put his name in the portal, but he wasn't accepting any media requests. Um, so who knows? Baldwin uh, might just uh, transfer. Well, well, I mean, as of now, he's still at Milwaukee. So um, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised though if he transferred into a bigger program, you know, um, 
and proved himself because this is a guy we were talking about maybe being a top 10 pick at the beginning of the season. And now we're talking about him at pick 30. So, yeah. All right. So now moving on, uh, Charlotte uh, drew, um, they've flamed out of the, they've been in the play on game two years in a row. And then they've got thumped both, both years. Um, and they also have uh, pick 15 um, from New Orleans. So uh, they got 13 and 15, almost back-to-back picks. What are you looking at for the Hornets? Yeah, I, I think with the Hornets right away, the one glaring issue, and I think people have probably talked about this, has got to be center for them. Um, I mean, they go Mason Plumley, They have Montrez Harrell, who was already, again, seems a bit disgruntled with the team. So I don't know what his tenure is going to look like. But they're pretty thin at center. I mean, Mason Plumlee's serviceable. And so TJ kind of stole my thunder here. I think Mark Williams would be a great pick for them at this spot. I do think guys like Coloco, uh, Walker Kessler could kind of, you know, fill the role of a rim running big who can defend the paint. I mean, when I was looking at their advanced uh, stats for the team, I mean, they're 22nd in defensive rating as a whole, 20th in points allowed in the paint. They give up the second most uh, second chance points and they're 21st in defensive rebounding. So I think they need somebody that can come in, really be a force in the middle. You have LaMelo Ball, who's a great, just has a great instinct for passing the ball, giving him a great lob target. So a big that can, you know, get up and down the floor well, which I think Mark Williams can do, I think would be a really solid addition for that team. Uh, They're young. I mean, as much as we want to, you know, harp on that, they've they've been kind of disappointing. They've, Like you said, they've gotten kind of taken out pretty badly in these last play-in appearances. They're still very young. Uh, Bridges is slowly starting to take those steps into becoming a, a scorer, like a, a first option type scorer. Lamelo has a great feel for the game. Uh, he can be a little bit careless for my taste, but I still think his feel for the game is great. And you give him, I know I mentioned Clint Capella, I think like a Clint Capella, Trey Young type relationship, a big that can move, run the court, fill the paint, crash the glass and be a great lob target for a Lamelo ball. I think it's got to be the first thing that they address. At 15, we also talked about him. I thought Jeremy Sochin would be another guy to look at. This is a team that needs help defensively. And so he's the type of player that he'll never be your first or second option offensively, but he can rove around all, you know, all over the court defensively, give you that energy, give you that spark. And I mean, teams, we've seen a lot of the best teams in the league over the years have had a player that can be just kind of a a jack of all trades, defend the one through the five if they have to bring that energy. I mean, not direct comparison, but the Warriors had a Draymond. You look at like the Suns having Mikel Bridges, these defenders, just high energy guys that know their role. I think Sochan can fill that. Another guy that I had, I was seeing just tossed around. I haven't really seen him play, so I can't speak to it was um, Marjan Bochamp on the wing. I don't really know about his defensive upside. I mean, I know he scored about 50 points a game. Uh, I was more curious as your guys thoughts on him. I, I haven't really seen him play. But, you know, I've seen people have him rated relatively highly, others lowly. So I thought maybe at 15, middle of the draft, that could be a player that they take a swing on. I haven't seen him enough. I would prefer Sochan. He fits more of a need. But um, I think if they walked away with a Mark Williams, Walker Kessler, and a Jeremy Sochan, almost back-to-back, I think they'd be very happy. You know, I've seen – Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I've seen Bochamp's range be from around late lotto to 20s. Yeah. And from the games that I've watched, I've watched maybe three full, maybe four. I think I watched four full G League and night games. And he's someone that is a – he's going to clean up and play hard and will get hustle points. He's not the greatest shooter. He's not a non-shooter, but he's not sure. – I'm not yeah. I'm not tasking him as someone that I think is a spacer, at least at this point in his career. But I don't mind it. And also just very quickly, uh, pairing Lamella with any sort of athlete that can catch lobs, I think is always – <laughs> uh, similar deal with when I mentioned Thunder for Mark Woods is the yeah, backup yeah. option, uh, Josh Giddy type throwing lobs. But yeah, I think that's a, pos- a potentially really nice fit for Mark and Charlotte. And speaking of one of the best lob catchers in college basketball this year was Kendall Brown. So we have every, I think we have every other team on our list uh, taking Sohan, <laughs> but nobody <laughs> wants Kendall Brown. But Kendall Brown is a great uh, lob lob target. So, uh, yeah. Um, so moving on in our last pick of the lottery is Cleveland's. And um, look over the uh, Cavs roster. You know, first of all, the um, middle of the road offensive team and top 10 defensive team this year. Um, 
you know, they went with that big lineup and uh, that served them well. Um, you know, I, I, I think what th- this pick is going to come down to what they want to do with Sexton. Um, there's been a lot of talk about him being moved. Uh, he's a restricted free agent. The qualifying offer is uh, somewhere between seven and eight million. So that's a no brainer. Um, the question is, is he the best fit for this team? Um, I'm not crazy about Isaac Okoro uh, right now starting at the two. Um, and so, uh, but I'm not crazy so much about Sexton starting at the two. So my, my feeling is, um, you know, if, if they, if they do, well, I, if they do move Sexton, uh, even if they don't, I, I, I think I, I was looking at uh, Dyson Daniels and, um, you know, TJ talked about him at length. And what pick was that, TJ? Number 11 for the Knicks. Okay. So, um, so he might not go this far, but, uh, you know, as TJ mentioned, the one weakness about his game is the shot. But, you know, I look at his shooting form and I think it's really nice. I think it's just a matter of time. You know, the sample we saw this year was pretty small. So I I think that uh, I'm not worried about his shot. Um, So, and as TJ said, he can do a little bit of everything, including being a big point guard. So I really like him. Um, If he wasn't available, uh, well, you know, this might be a place for a body to land. Um, uh, maybe uh, probably a little too early for Caleb Love or Hardy. Uh, and I don't know if those guys would be an upgrade over Sexton. Um, yeah. So what are you guys thoughts on Cleveland? This is, this is an interesting team. I would love Ochai Baji for Cleveland. I think just someone that's steady three and D don't take away the ball from Darius Garland. They also have Karis Levert at this point. Not sure if he's there for long-term, but he's not taking the ball away from Karis Levert. He's three and D to the T I think in Cleveland. I think they're not that far off from being a real team to consider in the, in the playoffs. Cause Evan Mobley's just going to get better. He's already this good as a rookie. I can only imagine his sophomore year jump. So yeah, that's, that's who I would think of for Cleveland. But do you think they keep Sexton? I'm not sure if they can find a, a spot from the trade. I would think that'd be best. I don't think Sexton, his offensive upside is nice in terms of just being someone that can get a bucket, but outside of just scoring, he's not really making anyone else better on the team. He's not making Darius Garland's life easier. He's not making Evan Mobley's life easier. So I think if they can find a spot to trade him, great. If not, then I guess you have to ride it out with him, but also Ochai Baji, he wouldn't have to be a starter off the bat. I think he's well content to be someone that comes off the bench initially I agree. and maybe fills in at closing minutes or in minutes where they need his defense in the six, five size with his, his athleticism on the court. Yeah. I, I think a, a Baji is going to be a coach's dream. You know, this, this is the player who's going to just do what you ask him to do and not going to be complaining or anything like that. Drew, do you have any uh, final thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, I just pulled it up really quick. So Levert has two years left on his deal, so he'll finish up this season, and then he's got one. He's got he's on contracts on the books for next year. So I think that they'll ride it out with him for at least one more season. And I think him and Sexton are a little bit redundant in terms of their scoring. Like I don't know if you need both of them. I do agree that I think Ochai would be a really great fit. I think I think Ochai is one of those players in the draft where wherever he ends up, he's going to stick, and he'll have you know he'll be valuable. Um, I I think Sexton they. You know, the scoring punch that he provides, I do think they'll look to move him Um, because I think this is a team that might be looking and, you know, I'll be curious to see what they do with Kevin Love's contract. He has those massive two years left. Um, I mean, I think this is a team that is done a pretty good job right now of balancing ready to compete at a pretty high level, not not championship contend, but be a playoff team and still keep the youth movement alive. So I think Sexton might be a casualty of that where they look to maybe, again, try to bring in a, a more traditional veteran to fill the bench. And then I do agree. I think Ochai just, like I said, I think anywhere he goes, he'll fit. And I could totally see Ochai Baji ending up on this team and filling a Herb Jones or like a Trey Murphy, like the Pelicans rookies roles where it's, they prove themselves out the season and then come a play in game or a first round series. He's out there in a closing lineup, taking big, making and taking big shots and, and playing defense. So 
I like where the Cavs are at. I think I think Sexton's a casualty of the Carriers Levert trade, unfortunately. I think that's what's gonna end up happening. And they're gonna ride out Levert for the next two seasons. And um, but I mean, I'm looking at their roster and their best players are all 23 or younger. Right. Right. No, I think they're in very good shape. It's time to bring on our special guest, Stanley Amudier, a three-time All-Summit selection who helped Arkansas reach the Elite Eight for the second consecutive year in his low season with the Razorbacks. With Arkansas this season, he averaged 11.9 points per game, 4.6 rebounds per game, and 1.8 steals and blocks per game with solid shooting splits. Uh, He shot 46% from the field, 37% from three, and 72% from the foul line. He ranked at the 70, 76th percentile among all D1 players uh, for points per position and ranked 15th in the ACC with a true shooting percentage of 55.9. Welcome, Stanley. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. All righty. So um, I don't think I've, we've ever had a guest with a more unusual situation uh, in South Dakota uh, you finished ninth in, in the country in scoring with nearly 22 points per game. You ranked in the top 10 in the summit for just about every major category you could think of. And then you go to Arkansas, uh, a team that just got off an elite eight uh, appearance the previous year. And you basically went from being the man to being among a group of, um, I mean, there, I don't know if there was one particular star on the team. Maybe you might say uh, Jalen Williams or uh, J.D. Note. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, uh, for example, your usage percentage, uh, you know, as your senior year at South Dakota was third in the country. I don't know if you know that. It was uh, almost 35%, and this year it dropped to 21%. Um I think you played about 28, 29 minutes per game. Is that right? Yeah, about that. Right. So how was that? I mean, what what to me is unusual for you going to be such a highly productive player on, you know, the man, um, you know, an all-conference selection to being a just a guy among guys as a role player on an Arkansas team. No, yeah, it was, it was different, you know, um, but I was – I had kind of my mindset on it already coming into the situation. So it wasn't like anything that, you know, I was surprised by when I got here, but, um, you know, it was the sacrifice that I was willing to make, you know, to, you know, for the team to make sure that we were going to be, everyone was just going to be a star in their role so that we can, you know, be as good as we we could be. Okay. Um, And did, did it live up to expectations? I mean, were you, do you, do you think you made the right decision? For sure. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't trade this past year for, for anything. You know, I think it was one of the best years of my life to this point. And, you know, from, from the minute I entered the transfer portal, I kind of had a, a good idea that, you know, Arkansas was where I wanted to go. And, you know, um, coach Musselman did a good job of, you know, making sure I knew what I was getting myself into and in all aspects of it, you know, with the fans and, and everything like that. And the fans were great all year. Um, even when we were kind of went through some adversity at the beginning of the season, uh, you know, people stuck with us and they believed in us and, you know, we were able to turn it around. Okay. I'm going to pass it over for TJ. What's up, Stanley? Thanks for joining us, man. We already touched, touched on it a little bit, but how was playing at South Dakota different than playing at Arkansas in terms of the competition, the atmosphere, obviously the March Madness experiment. Can you sort of give us a little comparison of the two? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big difference, you know, uh, at South Dakota, you know, the, we were, the attendance for home games and stuff like that was, you know, were nowhere near what it was like at Arkansas, you know, at the sellout games. And obviously, uh, the last year at, at South Dakota, I was there, it was COVID. So that had an impact on it too. So, um, but no, Arkansas, you know, it was, it was kind of what you grow up when you think about playing college basketball, at least for me. Um, you know, I, I envision, you know, those atmospheres like how we had against Auburn and, and how we had against Kentucky and, and, and Tennessee and LSU games like that at home. So really the the main thing, you know, the home games and uh, as far as like the basketball part, um, the skill level is not. I mean, the SEC is, is way different than the Summit League. But as a whole, you know, in the beginning of the season, we, we struggled with some mid-major teams as well. So it's just kind of like, you know, it just really depends on what team you're playing against. 
Right on, Stanley, man. I appreciate you taking the time. So coming into this season or wrapping up this season, I guess, you made a career high 37% from deep this season. Did you adjust your mechanics at all? I know, you know, going back and looking at your career, your three balls consistently been improving, even just even if it's slight improvements, you've been getting better and better from deep. How did you continue to improve your shot and what are you going to do going forward to make sure that three ball stays sharp? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. You know, I had a lot of people asking me this year, you know, uh, when did you turn into a dead eye shooter? Like, like things <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I think it was just reps for me. Um, I've always felt like I had that in my game, but I kind of never really, you know, at South Dakota, I had more responsibility on the offensive end. So I couldn't really just focus on being a catch and shoot, you know, uh, shot maker. So I think for me, it was really just um, realizing what, what, what was going to get me on the court and what was going to keep me on the court, you know, at Arkansas. And I carved out that role for myself a little bit, you know, towards the, the beginning of conference uh, and, you know, once I realized that the team was relying on me to make open threes, I really just, you know, started repping it, repping it as much as I could and, and making sure that I was going to be ready to do that. I was uh, watching uh, last night, actually, I watched your LSU, your home game against LSU. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know if you can beat the SEC for excitement. You know what I, I, I you know what I'm saying? I mean, I think the Big Ten, talking about fan involvement, um, maybe the Big Ten is up there, but uh, SEC, I, I, it must be exciting to to play in front of those those crowds. Yeah, it's different. It's completely different. You know, that there's nothing like it. You know, the fans take their basketball serious here, and you know, in a lot of places in the SEC, I think uh, I think there's a lot of places in the SEC where there's not an NBA team in, in the location of the college, so. That also makes it, you know, the fans way more engaged to what we're doing. It's like we're the, it's like we're their pro team over here. So, you know, they take real pride, especially Arkansas. Their fans, their fans are wild. Yeah, yeah. Everybody thinks that the SEC is a football conference, but man, if you haven't seen SEC basketball, you're missing out. Um, SEC might have been the best conference in the country this year. Yeah, they might have. They might have been the best conference in terms of tournament representation. You guys put on. Mm -hmm. So moving on to my uh, schedule question is uh, where, where are you in the draft process uh, in, in, in what lies ahead for uh, have you, have you heard from the league uh, or any international teams? Um, will you, I, I don't need, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure. Are you, you were basically out of eligibility, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I just used uh, a grad transfer. So this was my last year of eligibility. Right. Because I'm seeing a lot of guys that either pulling out of the draft or going into the portal. So I'm thinking people are already getting feedback from the league. But as a but as a super senior, they probably don't do that for you, do they? Um, no, I, I actually just got back from Virginia. I was over there doing the, the Portsmouth Invitational. You know, it's a senior combine. So I was over there doing that. Ah, nice. I got to, um, I got to interview with some NBA teams and get some you know feedback and get to know a little bit excellent um can you share uh you know how that experience was uh, you know what kind of things were you hearing and how'd you do at Portsmouth yeah uh, it was good you know um we won our first game and we put us in the winner's bracket so we were able to play for third place on Sunday and we lost that game or on Saturday we lost that game the third place game but you know it was a good experience. I played well. You know, got to meet a lot of the the top seniors around the country, and you know there was a lot of NBA scouts there. They did some interviews. Kind of, they were just kind of really trying to get um background on us as players, and and really just trying to learn our story and how we got to where we are. And how did you feel like that process went? I feel like it was good. You know, it was a it was a blessing to be there. You know, I think it's something that you know it's a step in the right direction as far as where I'm trying to go. Okay, so um. Do you think you do you think you'll get uh will you be attending I know you have to get invited to the G League or I guess any combine you have to get invited to but do you do you foresee uh being invited to any of the combines coming up Oh yeah for sure you know I feel like I, I deserve to be there and you know we're going to find out in these next couple of weeks or so about you know when and where those are going to be taking place And have you have you heard from any international teams no, I haven't spoken to any international teams. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to pass it back to TJ. And you just mentioned, Stanley, how you was at the Portsmouth and was talking to NBA scouts, executives. What were you telling them in terms of why they should take a chance on you, why they should invite you to training camp? How did you sell yourself to them? Um, 
I don't think it's really uh, for me. I wasn't really trying to sell myself to them. Just kind of trying to let them know about who I am as a person and, you know, kind of just, you know, they were just kind of more of a filling out process as far as, you know, uh, selling myself. I'll, I'll let, let my, you know, game do the talking. Yeah, speaking of your game, very quickly, what do you think are you talk about your shooting improvements, but do you think that's your biggest strength or what do you consider your biggest strength as a player? Um, I think I I think just vers versatility, you know, on the offensive and defensive side. I think um, you know, I'm able to adapt to a lot of different situations that, you know, as far as being in the league, you know, there's, you know, you're not always going to be the top top guy or top two, top three guys, but I think I'm able to, you know, you know, find a way to carve out a role and be effective and, and, and produce for, for any team that I, I find myself on. So I think that'll be something that, you know, separates me from a lot of people. So TJ already mentioned it, Stanley, you kind of have the aspects of your game that are going to translate well to the next level. I kind of want to touch base on what do you think some of the intangible things that you bring to the table, you know, as someone who's played five seasons of college basketball, went through the process of being the guy, adapting to being a role player, making a run in the tournament, what are some of the things, you know, from your leadership qualities and stuff like that you think you can bring to the team as someone who's been playing a lot of high-level basketball for the last five years? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, like you said, a lot of uh, leadership and experience I could bring, you know, right away. I feel like even as an older guy in this draft class, um, I, feel I have a lot of potential or higher ceiling, I could say. But, you know, just like you said, you know, playing around, playing for five years in college basketball, played at South Dakota, in Arkansas, you know, had to interact with a lot of different types of people. So I think um, that could be an intangible that I could bring to the table, you know, just being able to, you know, interact with all types of people from, from anywhere. And uh, Stanley, uh, what, what types of things, you know, we, we talked about your strengths, but uh, what types of things would you like to work on as, you know, as leading up to the draft? I mean, I know certain guys, you know, focus on, you know, like one or two things that they really, you know, want to, to approve upon by the time they, they get to, to workouts and private workouts and things like that. So what types of things are, are you focusing on? Uh, really just my, you know, all around game, you know, playing, at, playing at a high level and, you know, being able to play make, you know, not only for myself, but for my teammates, um, definitely continuing to work on my rebounding and, and defense, even, even though I feel like I'm a really improved defender this year. So, um, you know, you, it's, there's always room to get better. You know, I'm going to keep working it every day. I work to get better on, on basically everything, but, you know, playmaking and just continuing to, you know, take care of my body so that I'm in my best shape is going to be my, my biggest focus this summer. Would you say the biggest difference in your role between your last year at South Dakota and Arkansas was your opportunities to playmake? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, that wasn't really what I was – wasn't really my role at, at Arkansas. At, at South Dakota, my senior year especially, I had a lot of um, responsibility on the offensive end. So the ball was in my hand a lot more, which gave me a lot more, you know, um, a lot more feel for the game and, it, and being able to play and make at the same time. But, you know, at Arkansas, I was more – I had to make quick decisions when, when I got the ball. So it wasn't as far – it wasn't me being able to play and make as much. Right. Right. So I'm hoping you stick around for just a couple more minutes. We uh, have this segment called the mailbag where listeners uh, send us questions and we actually have a couple for you. Um, and uh, do you mind doing that? Uh, that's cool. Yeah, I'll do a couple. OK, so. Um, all right. So here's our mailbag for, for this week. And our first email email is no name. This says the letters T.H., and he wants to know if you are better at Monopoly, Nerf gun battles, or driving drones. Ha <laughs> th. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with Nerf gun battles. <laughs> Did you? Uh, he told me you lost. You guys lost it. We're talking about Tyler Hagedorn. Oh, you I, I know who said that. And uh, he um, he said you guys lost a drone in a tree. Yeah, we sure did. <laughs> sure did. did you ever get it back nah i don't know where, <laughs> where it went i don't know where it is <laughs> all right uh, all right so nerf gun battles it is um 
And uh, next question is from Caleb, and he wants to know uh, what's your favorite uh, NBA player to watch and who is the best player that you've faced so far in your career? My favorite NBA player to watch, um, either Kevin Durant or Steph Curry. Okay. The best player I've played against in my career? It's a great question. I don't know. Okay. I, yeah, I don't know. All right. Okay. Well, we, uh, I, I'm trying to think, uh, yeah, I, I don't know who all the out of uh, conference teams you played in South Dakota, but yeah, South Dakota, Max Acemas, you know, he was, he was crazy. Yeah. You know, right. yeah. Yeah. You guys had, you guys had a tough tournament, right, man. You guys played some really good teams. You guys, you guys came out, man. You guys played a lot of really good players. I'm just trying to think. Mm-hmm. First thing that comes to mind is Gonzaga's. Their 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 players, obviously. Yeah. Uh, they're pretty stacked. I'm not sure if you think, you know, it's not matching up against Chet Holmgren, but yeah, boy, he's pretty nice. I mean, both those big guys they had were good, were legit. So um, Paulo was real good too. You know. Hey, I got one more question for you. Are you? Uh, I know you're you're in Fayetteville now, right? Mm-hmm. And as far as I know, Jalen is still in Fayetteville. Have you guys been working out together or? No, nah, I haven't seen him much since the season ended, but, you know, he's been around. He's got – he's still more in – you know, he's only a sophomore, so he's still doing some more school-type school, school type things. But, you know, he's I've seen him around. Okay. And Tyler was going to join us. Uh, he's going to surprise you and come on the show, but he's practicing with the uh, uh, three-on-three uh, national national team, so we couldn't we couldn't work that out. Uh <laughs> All right. Well, I, pr- I appreciate it, Stanley. Thanks so much for uh, coming on and we wish you the best and we'll definitely be following your progress and uh, we'll stay in touch. And um, yeah, it's great having you. For sure. Appreciate you guys. All right. Oh, man. Thanks, Stanley. And lastly, uh, we do have another email and this is, I, I don't know if you guys can help me with this pronunciation. If you look, you guys I believe, know. and I could be wrong, I believe that's Anuj Agarwal. Uh, uh, Agar, Agarwal? Agarwal? Okay. Agarwal? I'm gonna, I think I'm that gonna, might be it. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. And he is the founder of Feedspot. And he, uh, he wrote to us and he said, I would like to personally congratulate you uh, as your website, Hoops Prospects Podcast, HPP, has been selected for by our panelists as one of the top 20 NBA draft podcast on the web and he gives the address which is blogspot or blog.feedspot.com slash mba underscore draft underscore podcast but anyway if you go to blog.feedspot.com uh, apparently they rate all kinds of podcasts for uh, different categories and we made their top 20 for draft podcasts which was uh, which was pretty awesome so that was uh, that's the last of our email for today. Uh, but I do have one other announcement, which uh, which I'm excited about. Actually, two uh, two weeks from today, we're going to have Len Elmore, a former college great, NBA great, now the head of the NBA Retired uh, Players Association. Uh, Len is a broadcaster. Uh, he's a lawyer. Uh, he works on the night project. He's just got a million things going on, but uh, his career uh, started in the seventies and um, he's been involved in basketball ever since then. So man, I'm really excited because what a wealth of knowledge that's going to be. And uh, in June, uh, we just heard from Danny Manning and Danny Manning will be joining us just before the draft about 10 days before the draft. Uh, he just landed a new spot uh, with Louisville um, as an assistant coach. So we will have uh, Danny Manning coming on the show. So that's a Hall of Famer is going to be joining us in a couple of months. So they are the la- two announcements I wanted to make. So that's about it for uh, today. And uh, please keep on sending your questions to admin at hoopsprospects.com. That's A-D-M-I-N. I want to thank our special guest, Stanley Amoudier, for coming on the show. I also want to thank all of our listeners and make sure to join us next week as we continue to talk about uh, this year's draft prospects, the NBA playoffs, and more. We'll be joined by coach and trainer, Andrew Heath, 
and possibly others. Um, I just want to apologize. A couple times we've announced we're going to have this guest or that guest. And, uh, you know, with players, you know, preparing for the draft and dealing with agents and so forth, uh, they don't always... Um, we haven't been able to always get them on the show. Uh, so, yeah. But uh, So I apologize for that. <laughs> so sometimes when we think we're going to have a guest, we don't. And then sometimes we have surprise guests. So it all works out kind of crazy. So that's it for this week. Uh, we'll see you next week.